Well, okay. <clears throat> Let me start from the beginning. <laughs> my childhood, my upbringing was very soulful. Mm -hmm. Disco was huge in New York. This is, you know, the capital. Right. This was the capital for that, you know. And I had like the first commercial 12 inch that was ever released on South Soul as a kid. You know? Wow. Early Patrick Adams stuff. All those records are part of my upbringing, you know. My dad used to bring those records home. I used to play them. I had 45s, so a lot of the stuff that later became 12 inches. And house music is just the next step from disco. And when disco died, house music started and took over. If you go to Chicago and ask an old school DJ about house, Mark Farina? Now, even more old school than that. Yeah. You know, we're talking about like, you know, like uh, people like uh, Frankie Knuckles and, you know, from his era, you know, they'll tell you that house music. A lot of it wasn't even electronic in the beginning, you know. They were, they were just four on the floor dance records. You know, mm -hmm. They were out maybe like in 77, 78. Chopping up disco records, basically? Not even chopping up. They were disco records. Right. But they, they, they were considered house, the beginning, the early stages of house. Yeah. And then the electronic era took over in the, you know, 83, 84, 85, and that's when it just blew up. Um, so I embraced all of that because to me it's still soul music. Right. You know, it's this syncopated soul, sped up soul. Um, you know, a lot of the earlier tracks that came out of Chicago, New York, and New Jersey may not have had vocals, but a lot of the backing music on top of those beats were, were you know, replayed soul records or, you know, based on an old school track. So for me, and, I, and and then the other thing is, as a DJ, you know, for me it was always about rocking the crowd, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And in 88, 80, 89, house music was quite commercial, you know, it was sort of like, you could turn on the radio. Real McCoy, well, La Bouche, yeah, that kind of stuff. Even, even more soulful than that, yeah. you know, you had groups like Ten City, you had an artist named Diva, you had... Yeah. Group called Touch. I mean, there were so many yeah. records, but they were great songs. And major labels embraced that that music. Mm -hmm. Crystal Waters, you know, Lil Lewis had a major deal with Epic, Sony, Sony Records. And hip hop artists started getting house mixes because it was just the mode. You know, that was the era. You know, if you went out to a club, you know, in the early late '80s, early '90s, you were most likely going to hear house in the club, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe 30 minutes later you might hear a hip hop record, you might hear Big Daddy Kane Raw, you know, and then maybe 30 minutes after that you might hear Soul to Soul Joint. So it was always about entertaining and rocking the crowd and just playing, you know, music that everybody could enjoy. It just turns out that the commercial world abandoned house and it became more underground in the 90s and the, uh, it just lost some of its face value. It just became more of a, of a cult music for like the hardcore fans of it. Um, I was in, I got into it in 88 and I fell out of it, fell out of touch with the scene and the music. Really? Probably in 94, 95. The scene wasn't as big. Right. It went really underground. That's when I started going really hard on the hip hop production. Right. But I've been a b-boy from day one. Like, yeah. you know, all the early hip hop records that were being made, you know, I was hip to them, you know, a lot of them were, weren't were really like big records, they were more like street records, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like Super Rhymes by uh, Jimmy Spicer or, you know, obviously Sugar Hill Gang, that kind of stuff, but you had like Spooner Rap by Spoonie G, uh, Fatback Band, King Tim III, which was considered the first rap record, like all these records, I had them all, you know, and actually, those records kind of bridged the gap between hip hop and disco yeah. because they a lot of the backing tracks were were uh, replayed disco records. Yeah, because all of a sudden the the DJ is now losing its popularity and the MC is all of a sudden like exactly. coming into the yeah, forefront. Exactly, and you know we didn't have sampling technology back then. Right, and uh, you know it was standard for a band, a house band, to come in and play the track 
as opposed to a DJ. Wow. I mean, there were a f maybe uh, there was one record I, I remember, the Crash Crew. They made a record where, uh, and it was that was kind of groundbreaking for its time. But they had the uh, the DJ back cueing Freedom get up and dance for the recording. Right. Um, you know, which was brilliant for that time. Yeah. But they weren't really. I can't think of any other record like that during that time. You're talking about 1980. Uh, so bands were the they were the backbone for the for the and then once the drum machine came in and the samplers came right. in that's when it all changed <laughs> the whole game changed right.